He's Ross Tucker, our good buddy, the Ross Tucker Football Podcast. He has got double duty on Westwood One Radio this weekend. In the booth with Kevin Harlan, Saturday night Dolphins at the Chiefs, then working the sidelines Sunday night, Rams and the Lions. Okay, let me start with the weather in Kansas City, and what role does that play in this game? Well, first of all, Dan, you'll appreciate this because I knew I'd be getting two games this weekend. I knew one would be sideline and one would be in the booth. So when my boss, Howie Denneroff, said, okay, Saturday night you're in Kansas City, (laughs) I thought, oh, my (laughs) goodness. Last I checked, they're calling for negative 15. I thought he was putting me on the sideline. (laughs) Thank goodness I'll be in the booth. It has a major impact. Now, listen. I played in one of the 10 coldest games in Buffalo Bills franchise history, which ironically, Dan, was in Cincinnati. Cincinnati's like on the Kentucky border. I had no idea it got that cold in Cincinnati. I mean, it was freezing. It was so bad that after the game, you had to start your shower almost cold, like lukewarm at best. Otherwise, your skin would sting. It would, I mean, it stung anyway, but the warmer the water, the more it would sting your skin from the frostbite. The important thing to note about the weather is the ball expands. It gets harder. It's hard as a rock. So when I was a center, Dan, I hated the colder it was because I don't have huge hands, right? So the bigger the ball would get, the harder it is, the harder it would be for me to grip. So what does that mean? That means that's an issue for the quarterbacks. It's definitely an issue for the receivers because it's like they're catching a rock that is as hard as you can imagine, full of air. Plus, I think it leads to a couple fumbles. It's almost like you're you're carrying this uh, this balloon that's totally filled to the max, and it's, it's waiting and ready to pop out. It's going to have an impact on the game for sure. And then Buffalo... 10-point favorites with wind and snow up there. How does that impact that game? Probably helps the Steelers, right? I mean, usually when you're an underdog, especially a big underdog, the worse the weather conditions are, the better it is because it levels the playing field a little bit. I don't know that I feel that way Saturday night with the guys flying up from Miami where it's 70-some degrees and all of a sudden having to experience that in KC. I don't care where you're from originally. It's hard to get your body acclimated to that. Whereas for the Steelers, I think it helps them, right? I mean, I don't envision them throwing the ball over the place anyway. If this becomes a game where both teams have to run the ball a lot, could be an old school Steelers game. Najee Harris is finally, in my opinion, Dan, started to run like a Steelers running back. You know, like Barry Foster and Bam Morris and Uh, Jerome Bettis, I mean, that's kind of this game the way it needs to be for the Steelers, and that's how Najee Harris has been playing. That's how the Steelers' offensive line has been blocking. I think the worse the weather is in Buffalo, the better chance the Steelers have, although it's still very much an uphill climb for them without T.J. Watt. I think I saw a stat where they're 1-10 in without him. The team that may have a coaching change if they lose this weekend, who are those teams, if any? Yeah, um, well, it sounds like there's enough speculation out there that it sounds like Dallas is one of them, and that wouldn't surprise me. I mean, if they lose at home to the Packers, I think that would be real bad for Mike McCarthy because there was already some speculation that they might do something last offseason. I think McDermott probably solidified his position based on these last five games, winning the division, getting a home playoff game, number two seed. But if he lost to the Steelers, there might be some questions asked. And then the last one, because I you know, I do a lot of stuff in Philadelphia, they're asking it a lot in Philadelphia right now, is Nick Sirianni. Now, that would surprise me, but the last couple games, I mean, this stretch, it's been bad, really bad. If they go out there on Monday night and lay an egg and lose by 20 points, well, then... Howie Roseman, the GM, Jeffrey Lurie, the owner, they're going to have to figure out what the heck happened here where the team went from 10-1 and to totally falling apart, and then they have to decide whether or not Sirianni and whoever he would hire, maybe for both coordinator positions, certainly you would think defensive coordinator, whether or not Sirianni is the right person 
to get this thing going back on track and, and get the right coordinator hires. He's Ross Tucker, Westwood One CBS sports analyst and a former offensive lineman, spent one season with the New England Patriots. So obviously very emotional for you, for Bill Belichick to uh, step down there, I'm guessing, right? Well, all your great memories with Bill Belichick? I, I think you might have asked me this before. I think he said something to me three or four times the whole time. When I first got signed that day, he walked up the steps in like the theater room, the team meeting room, and uh, I stood up to shake his hand, and all he said was, you don't need to get up. That was it. You don't need to get up. Like, I don't even think he said hi. Um, one time, that first week of practice, I fell on the ground, and he had this unbelievable ability, Dan, to like say something to you without even looking at you or letting people know. He, was, he walked by me, and all I heard was somebody in the corner of my ear say, Stay off the effing ground, will you? <laughs> That's it. That was it. It was really, it was a bonding experience. Um, a couple weeks later, we played the Jags in the playoffs, and my my college teammate was starting at center, and he said, again, walked by, never made eye contact. We got half the freaking Princeton team in this game, okay? <laughs> and then uh, and then they traded me, and I actually talked to him for the first time. They traded me. I went in his office and everything. I sat down. He told me why they were trading me to Cleveland, so – yeah, it was emotional. Um, all the pictures, all the memories, the moments we have. I will say this, though, Dan, in all sincerity, man, I got a lot of questions about this. So now it comes out that it was written into Mayo's contract that he was Belichick's successor, right? I guess I'm assuming that Belichick knew about that and was okay with that. But it's still a little awkward, right? I mean, if you're the successor, don't you want to take over and start making the six million or eight million, whatever it says in the contract? Like Mayo's probably making a million bucks, maybe two. And it probably says in the contract, well, when you take over, you're making six, seven, or eight, whatever it is. Don't you want that to happen as soon as possible? Yeah, but it was written into the contract. You don't want to coach three more years? No, it was written into the contract 2024 was when this was supposed to take place that he would take over for Belichick next season. And therefore, Bel they probably thought when they signed this deal that Belichick would surpass Don Shula in the all-time victory list. Uh, but still, if you're Belichick, you're, you're signing up for that, literally signing up for that, that you and the Patriots at some point know you're going to part ways here. He was trying to keep his job, I think, for maybe one more year, but... You know, it's written in Mayo's contract, so he got the succession plan. So it was just kind of strange that Belichick would then just move on from the Patriots after 2024. Yeah, and I'd also say this, Dan. I, I think it's a missed opportunity by the Patriots, right? What's so interesting is that when you play in New England, and I was there 05 and then 06, all they talk about is the process, the process, the process, right? It's not about the results. It's about the process. I'm a little surprised, Dan, that the Patriots didn't use this opportunity to at least interview some other guys. I mean, they've been bad the last few years. Why not pick the brains of some of these coaching candidates and say, what the heck do you think is going on with us? Like, why, why are we so bad? What would you do, Ben Johnson or Mike Vrabel? Like, whoever, what would you do if we made you the head coach? To just give the job to Mayo, and by the way, everybody raves about him. I don't know him that well, but literally everybody says he's awesome, great guy. Maybe he'll be an awesome coach, but I'm just surprised that such a process-oriented franchise didn't interview anybody. Because also, if you interview people, Dan, then you can say, yeah, we interviewed these six guys, but Mayo was clearly the best. Instead, if you just give it to Mayo, man, if he gets off to a bad start or if things don't go well, you're really opening yourself up to heavy criticism regarding the process or lack thereof. Well, also, you're going to have a rookie coach who's never been a head coach, and you're probably going to have a rookie quarterback in there, maybe again. Now, I know it worked for Houston, but they're an outlier when it comes to a rookie coach and a rookie quarterback. And, Dan, you're hiring the head coach before you hire the GM, yeah. which creates a very unique dynamic, right? Like, usually... The GM is kind of the coach's boss because the GM is looking out not only for the short-term interest of the, of the franchise, but the long-term, whoever they hire as GM, they're not Mayo's boss. I mean, that 
Mayo is going to be part of hiring them. I mean, and they had nothing to do with Mayo getting hired. It's a really strange dynamic, if you ask me. The most attractive coaching vacancy is one. I think it's I think it's hard not to say the Chargers. And, and I'm aware of their cap issues for next year, but you can manipulate the cap a lot. You can you can restructure contract. Look, they could just take all the pain this year and then be good to go 2025 and beyond. Or they can restructure guys, manipulate guys. What's the thing that all these open jobs have in common, right? The Titans and the Falcons and the Raiders and the Patriots and whoever. They don't have good quarterbacks. They don't, they don't have top 20 quarterbacks. You, it, it's really hard to win or have sustained success without a top 20 guy. All these guys that got fired, none of them have top 20 guys. You could argue maybe Pete Carroll – Geno Smith's still top 20, maybe. But they were they made the playoffs last year, winning record this year. The Chargers have a top 10 guy. Nobody disputes that. That should be where you'd want to go because I don't care about the draft choices in Washington or New England. You could draft a guy, and it might be C.J. Stroud, or it might be Bryce Young. And you don't know which. Nobody does. It's a 50-50 proposition, it feels like. I'm going to the Chargers. I think they got lower expectations out there. The media is not that bad, and you have Justin Herbert and some other really good pieces around him. He's Ross Tucker. Have fun this weekend. Saturday night, Kansas City and the Dolphins. He'll be in the booth with Kevin Harlan. And then Sunday night, Rams at the Lions. So, uh, you know, you don't have to – you're walking the sidelines in a dome there. How much pressure is on Jared Goff in this game? Well, yes. First of all, I'm thrilled that I'm on the sideline indoors. I mean, Dan, that the first home playoff game in 30 years, that's going to be bananas. I mean, that's going to be a top five football environment of my lifetime. I think there's pressure on him because of the fact that they're playing the Rams as much as anything else. And it's interesting when you hear his quotes this week, it, he's still not over it. So I don't know if that's a positive or a negative. <laughs> I don't know if that's like a, a chip on his shoulder but he's a Cali kid who was playing in L.A. He loved it. He loved everything about California being out there. I think it still bothers him that he got traded to Detroit. And he really wants to show the Rams and McVay that they messed up. I don't know. Maybe that's great and he goes out and plays really well. Or maybe he tries too hard and turns it over a couple of times. But there's definitely pressure on him. He'll be the guy next year. But if he really performs poorly – then the people in Detroit will start that conversation up again. Is he the guy that can get us to the next level in the postseason? Have fun this weekend. Thank you, Ross. Thanks, man. I will. That's Ross Tucker, Westwood One CBS Sports Analyst. <laughs> 